Hello, we are ready to start part three of our look at the cardiovascular system. And in this video, we are focused on the physiology. Um, how exactly does the uh, cardiovascular system regulate the flow of blood throughout the body? Uh, so this is going to be a little bit longer of a video, so uh, let's go ahead and let's jump right into our look. And the first thing that we need to Remember, we have to go back to a and P1, back to your look at uh, and the learning of muscle and how muscle contracts. Uh, you spend a lot of time probably talking about uh, skeletal muscle, and you probably spent a little bit of time talking about smooth muscle. But what they both have in common is they both are dependent upon calcium. We know that calcium has to bind to something in order to initiate muscle contraction. And within our arterioles, and to a lesser degree within our veins and venules, within our arteries, within our arterioles, within our veins, within our venules, we have varying degree of smooth muscle within that tunica media. And it is that smooth muscle that is engaging in contraction. Now, because this is smooth muscle, Contraction is not stimulated through action potentials. Remember that from AMP1. Smooth muscle is not stimulated through an action potential. Instead, smooth muscle is stimulated through stretch receptors, through hormone activity, and through other chemical cues such as maybe pH. And so you've got these varying degrees of regulation that is going to be in charge of the oversight of stimulating smooth muscle to contract. What changes in pH does, what the presence of hormones such as epinephrine and norepinephrine, what they do, what stretch receptors do as blood volume increases and decreases and the pressure the hydraulic pressure being exerted within the lumen of the vessels, which allows for expansion and contraction. What all of those things do is they stimulate the release of calcium, and calcium binds to calmodulin, and calmodulin is what goes ahead and initiates contraction. Remember, there is not um, your traditional view of thick and thin myofilaments. Remember that um, the calcium actually binds to calmodulin, which is part of the thick myofilament. And because the thin myofilaments are not directly lined up, because they're more staggered, what this goes ahead and leads to is the ability for repeated and consecutive contractional forces, sustained contraction within smooth muscle. Which if we think about what we already know about pressure and hydraulic movement and hydrostatic pressure within the arterioles, if a vessel needs to vasodilate to, to, to accommodate a higher degree of blood flow so that you don't increase the blood pressure to a point of a dangerous level, you want that muscle to be able to relax and stay relaxed, vas vasodilated. Or if your blood pressure all of a sudden bottoms out because blood volume decreases and you need to offset that sudden drop in blood pressure by maintaining vasoconstriction, the last thing you want to have happen is a refractory period where the calcium has to unbind and thick and thin myofilaments are no longer engaged. So all of these things come into to the process of um, maintaining contraction because, again, we don't want that refractory period. We don't want the, 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 the smooth muscle within the arterioles to be vasoconstricted and then all of a sudden it have to relax. What would that do? Think about that all of a sudden the arterial relaxes and what happens to the blood pressure? It bottoms, it drops, it decreases. And so we try to avoid that. And the way that we avoid that is by 
having a continual contractional event that is stimulated by something other than a wave of depolarization and repolarization that we identify as being an action potential. Notice, an action potential has nothing here to do with whether or not smooth muscle contracts. Once the pH changes, the vessel can relax. The, the threat is over. Homeostasis is still there. Once the blood volume decreases, the stretch receptors don't detect that change anymore, the vessel can relax. Once nitric oxide isn't present as much, vasodilation can go ahead and relax. And so all of these regulatory controls are designed to not disrupt homeostatic measures that are there to maintain blood pressure. That is one area you do not want to go ahead and have a, an, a os oscillating up and down method. Contraction, vasoconstriction, relaxation, vasoconstriction, relaxation. Think about what that would do to the blood pressure systemically. So it's very important. It's very important that, um, yes, we have calcium. We know calcium is critical in that. But what stimulates the release of the calcium that binds to the calmodulin that allows for thick myofilaments to pull and attach and contract with the thin myofilaments in the absence of a sarcomere. And again, the answer is those changes in neurotransmitters, the hormones, uh, chemical properties, pH, stretch receptors, right? paracrines, remember, are simply hormones that are acting locally. Um, and so when we look at this, right, typically blood volume remains relatively uh, stable. Right? And the reason why blood volume remains relatively stable has to do with the fact that what is regulating blood volume is the kidneys. Now, we're not going to, when we get into the urinary system, we're going to talk something about RAS, R-A-A-S, the renin aldosterone, um, the, uh, I'm sorry, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And what RAS does is, RAS is, is stimulated by the kidneys to go ahead and regulate blood volume. In other words, if blood volume is too low, RAS, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, will go ahead and actually stimulate thirst. It will decrease the amount of urine output or the amount of filtrate that the kidneys are producing to conserve the blood volume. If there's too much blood volume, and if there's not, if there's too much about blood volume, the kidneys can then go ahead and stimulate a different group of cells, what we refer to as the JG cells, the juxtaglomerular cells, and they can actually increase the rate of filtration to remove more fluid out. And so, understand that the, 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 the volume of blood that you have is regulated very closely and, and that is in part due to the kidneys. What the kidneys cannot do is the kidneys cannot say, oh, we've got low blood volume and so we're going to somehow magically add more than what is already there. It can conserve what is there. It cannot add to. It can remove excess that is there, but it cannot add to. All right. Um, and so uh, we can go ahead and we can maintain a constant level of blood volume utilizing the kidneys and hormonal uh, response to go ahead and if the blood pressure is to, blood volume is too high, we can remove more fluid, which will decrease the blood pressure. Right? And if blood volume is too low, we can maintain a constant level to stabilize the blood pressure and possibly uh, increase it through other mechanisms. Again, things like thirst. Right? Uh, your mouth gets dry, your lips get parched. Right? That's all uh, regulated through the hypothalamus. Right? That stimulates you drinking typically water, which is going to add to the blood volume. All right. 
Um, now, it should also be right. Should also be noted that uh, the kidneys are not the only way we can regulate uh, blood pressure, right? uh, which which is a good thing. That kind of makes sense. All right, so we have vasoconstriction and vasodilation through the sympathetic nervous system. We're going to talk more about that um, in a little bit. The other thing that we can do uh, kind of within the system of the cardiovascular system to maintain blood pressure, and remember when we talk about blood pressure, we're really talking about blood volume as well. The veins actually can act as a storage area for, uh, for blood. And so when you are running down um, South Florida from T-Rex trying to protect your burger that you just got from Steak and Shake and maybe a, a Nutella milkshake uh, that you got as well, um, as, as you're protecting that Nutella milkshake and that burger from T-Rex as you're going and heading, running down Flor South Florida Avenue, um, excess blood within the veins are going to be pumped into the heart and pumped through the arterioles to support an increase in blood pressure, right? Because your vein, your arteries are going to be vasodilated, right? Which means you're, you're going to have to have more blood volume. Where's that blood volume coming from? It's coming from the veins, right? When you're done running from T-Rex and you're actually able to sit down and enjoy your, your garlic burger and your Nutella shake from, from Steak and Shake, um, what then happens what then happens is less blood is needed within the arterioles, and so it gets stored within the veins. So about at any point in time, under normal homeostatic conditions, about 60% of the blood is actually stored within the veins. Only about 11% is, uh, is really found within the arterioles, uh, and the other 70 f or the other 15 or so percent um, is typically within um, the heart itself. Uh, or within the coronary uh, vasculature, um, or within the pulmonary system. Um, and so that's kind of where the other 15 or so percent is typically located. So about 60% in the veins, about 11% within the, the arteries, and the remaining 15 to 19% is tied up within the coronary and pulmonary systems. So this is a huge coordinated effort that's involving the respiratory system, the cardiovascular system, and the urinary system to maintain blood pressure. Right? So this here is just a nice little graphical representation of what we are really looking at here and talking about. Right? So in this case here, if blood volume increases, that's going to lead to an increase in blood pressure. Right? The cardiovascular system is going to initiate vasodilation. Right? It may also try to decrease cardiac output. Right? So through an increase in vasodilation and through a decrease in cardiac output, what does that do? Well, that lowers the overall blood pressure. Right? And so your blood pressure drops back down to normal. Um, that's the quick response, but the slower response can be compensation by the kidneys where we excrete excess fluid to reduce blood volume. If you reduce blood volume, you're going to decrease that blood pressure, and that blood pressure is going to return back to normal. So we're not ready to talk about renal regulation of uh, the cardiovascular system. We're going to do that after we look at the respiratory and the digestive system. We'll finally get into the urinary system. So I'm saving that good stuff for then. Um, but what we do need to look at and try to understand is what is the role uh, within the cardiovascular system. And to understand that, we have to go back to the sympathetic nervous system. So remember, back in the uh, AMP1, probably one of the very last things you talked about in lecture was the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system is broken down into the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. Parasympathetic is rest and relaxation, and your sympathetic is your get up and go, your fight or flight response. And within the sympathetic nervous system, by the way, sympathetic nervous system has complete regulation and control over cardiovascular uh, response within the arteries and the veins. Your 
parasympathetic nervous system uh, is going to directly have influence over the heart. And so when, uh, when uh, acetylcholine is released into the sinoatrial node within the right atrium, uh, that, can act, that will actually slow down the firing of the SA node to decrease cardiac output um, and stroke volume. Um, whereas if epinephrine kicks a little bit higher within the heart, that's going to stimulate the production of those action potentials a little bit quicker within uh, the SA node. And so, so the heart is a little bit different, but when it comes to the vasculature, and the arterioles, we're dealing specifically with epinephrine and norepinephrine. And so you can see here uh, that norepinephrine, if, you, uh, if we increase norepinephrine uh, within the smooth muscle of the tunica media, within the arterioles, that causes vasoconstriction. Right? That causes vasoconstriction. If we decrease the amount of epinephrine that is within the uh, smooth muscle of the tunica media, within the uh, arterioles, that's going to cause vasodilation. That's going to cause vasodilation, so the, the vessels relax. Epinephrine, at the same time, can bind to uh, receptors within the smooth muscle, right? and it can also bind to muscles with the, cardio, the uh, cardiac muscle. Um, it, can, it will bind to receptors within the liver and will bind to receptors within the skeletal muscle, pr pr primarily dealing with the capillary beds. Um, and what that will do is, depending on what, what you're dealing with, um, if epinephrine binds to the liver, uh, what it does is it stimulates um, glycolysis to be initiated. In other words, it stimulates the liver to release glucose so that it can be converted into ATP. Um, within skeletal muscle, epinephrine leads to vasodilation within those arterioles so that blood can come into that area because we're assuming that you're getting up, you're, you're, you're getting up and going, right? you're, you're running, you're going down South Florida Avenue to protect your steak and shake burger and milkshake. Um, the heart needs to be stimulated. Right? So that sinoatrial node has to produce those action potentials even quicker. Why? because your arterioles are vasodilating, your skeletal muscles are screaming for more oxygen. And so stroke volume has to increase, increase in cardiac output to be able to maintain some level of functioning blood pressure. Um, and so this is very heavy with that sympathetic nervous system. Again, increase norepinephrine uh, and you deal with vasoconstriction. Decrease norepinephrine, you deal with vasodilation. Uh, and you increase epinephrine uh, within uh, smooth muscle, uh, within, the, uh, within the arterioles of the skeletal muscle, within the liver, within the heart, and you're going to deal with an increase in uh, function and activity. Um, and more specifically, when we're dealing with capillary beds, let's say capillaries going into the digestive system, if epinephrine binds to what we define as being alpha receptors, they do the opposite of what they typically do uh, when they bind to beta receptors. And so what we're dealing with over here is beta receptors. What we're dealing with right here is the binding to beta receptors. And what we're dealing with over here is the binding to alpha receptors. And when that epinephrine binds to alpha receptors in the capillaries, and we're going to talk about this next, uh, within the capillaries, when that happens, it actually causes constriction within those capillary beds and that diverts blood away from non-essential tissue to support the increased metabolic activity within things like skeletal muscle or cardiac muscle um, or to support the liver in conducting cell respiration and glycolysis through the breakdown of glucose. Um, and so uh, everything kind of works together right? and 
keep in mind that epinephrine, depending on the receptor that it binds to, can do both and vasoconstriction and vasodilation, which is needed. In some areas, you need vasodilation to increase blood flow, but you don't need that increase in blood flow everywhere. And so that's what the alpha receptors do. Um, so what I would like to do is I'd like to spend a few minutes um, talking about and getting you set up for regulating uh, this blood pressure. Um, and we're actually going to do that in a separate video. Um, but keep in mind as we get ready to think about this, right, if we look at all of the vasculature, and, and the, the vast majority of the vasculature that we have is actually capillaries. Um, almost 80% of, of all of the vasculature that we have is, is defined as being a capillary. Um, and so arteries and arterioles and veins and venules um, are simply a transport mechanism for where the action really happens within the tissue. And that all of those tissues are being supported through capillaries. So there's about 50,000 miles of capillaries uh, within, within the human body, each body, each adult body. Um, so think about that. It is, um, it's what, 3,000 miles from here to California, 6,000 miles round trip. All right, so you can easily make eight trips, eight round trips from Florida to California back and forth. Um, and that would be equivalent to the, how m the, the area or the length of, uh, capillaries that we have. And those capillaries are designed because they don't have a tunica media um, and they're really just a, a, a single layer of endothelium. So they're really, really thin. Um, simple, simple epithelia, think of it that way. And, and the reason for that is to allow for diffusion right, of key nutrients. Um, and because of that, red blood cells pass through the capillaries almost like a single file line one behind the next. Um, and so that gives you an idea of just how small of a, of a vessel that we are dealing with here. Right? And as we will discover in the next video, the, the blood flow here is regulated through precapillary sphincters. Right? It's regulated through precapillary sphincters. Um, and what does that look like? I'll go ahead and I'll cover this last little slide here for you, and then we'll we'll call it a day for this video. Now, well, here's your arterial side. Right? Here's your ve your venous side. Here's your capillary bed, right here. Right? And you have what we ref what we literally define as being um, a a meta arterial and a, a thoroughfare channel. In other words, blood is going to flow from one vessel directly through to the other vessel, from an arterial to the vein, through one main vessel. And what we define as being that meta-arterial or that thoroughfare channel. Uh, and then from here, blood gets diverted right, to the main portion of the capillary bed. Well, coming off of these little offshoots on the arterial end, on the arterial end, are these little ridges of smooth muscle that contain those alpha receptors that respond to epinephrine. And they are what we define as being precapillary sphincters. And when those precapillary sphincters are closed, it prevents the blood from entering into that capillary bed and it diverts it right on back into the venous supply so it can be recirculated uh, and, and diverted to areas of the body where it really is needed. Um, and so, uh, those precapillary sphincters are all along that meta-arterial or that thoroughfare channel. Uh, and again, it's there to direct the flow of the blood. It's uh, when, they, uh, when epinephrine is bound to it, those precapillary sphincters are constricted. Right? And that prevents the normal flow of blood into the capillaries, into the capillary bed prevents that blood flow from going into there and again diverts it back into uh, circulation and supply. Um, once it gets into the venous side of things, once it gets into that thoroughfare uh, channel, notice that 
the presence of precapillary sphincters diminish. And so blood will go ahead and kind of come into that tissue, which it needs to. Right? That tissue still needs to be able to get rid of waste product, of metabolic waste. That tissue is still metabolically active. And that's why you see that blood diverting a little bit um, into the capillary bed right there to allow for the removal of metabolic waste. And again, this here is just a, uh, another view of that um, to where we can actually even regulate uh, blood into the precapillary sphincters by causing vasoconstriction within an arterial. And uh, that is where we are going to stop this video. Um, we're going to come back and spend a good 15, 20 minutes looking at the next part of what we need to look at, which is... Uh, pressure changes, how exactly do nutrients get released and reabsorbed within these capillary beds? What, what's regulating all of this? How does oxygen know to unload? How does carbon dioxide know to come in? Um, how does urea and other nitrates know to come in? And so uh, with that said, uh, I'm going to leave you to kind of review this material and uh, jot down any questions that you have, continue to solidify your understanding of this material and uh, I can't wait to, to get into the actual physiology of how uh, nutrients exchange within these capillary beds. And so until then, uh, I'll catch you on the flip side.